everybody all and welcome to the Battleground to Breaking Ground from Texas Acrobilities webinar Tax Considerations for Farmers and Ranchers. The Battleground to Breaking Ground program and Texas Acrobility are funded through USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. As you can see, our program has multiple state and national partners that assist us in filling the needs of farmers and ranchers across the state and across the nation. I am your host and Program Manager, Erin Kimbrough, and I thank you for joining us today. We'll start the video with a quick introduction to the Battleground to Breaking Ground Program and Texas Agribility. Who we serve? We serve active duty military, military veterans, and other beginning farmers and ranchers across Texas and throughout the nation. provide education and support through both Battleground and Agribility. We do training online and in person. We do farm and ranch business planning, management, and production specific practices. We do hands-on learning opportunities. We offer disability support through case management, farm and ranch assessment, disability recommendations, and resource referral. Battleground to Breaking Ground has three phases. Phase one is optional, and we offer one-day workshops across the state of Texas in rural business ideas, business planning basics, and many resources to help farmers and ranchers start or expand their agriculture operations. They include resources such as USDA Farm Service Agency, USDA uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Credit, USDA Rural Development, Texas Department of Agriculture, and many others to make a one-stop shop for starting that farmer ranch or expanding it. Phase two consists of 16 weeks of online courses and actual business planning. We include individual education planning, a community of practice to assist you to develop your comprehensive business plan that you can use for farm and ranch management or for applying for funding. Phase two requires an application and applications are open in the summer and winter, as well as we have a tuition-based option that waives the application process. Phase three includes production education. We offer mentorship, hands-on training, and specific production agriculture courses that are offered online to meet your farm and ranch goals. Additionally, we have a YouTube channel where we post our recorded webinars. A couple of those webinars are resources for veteran farmers and ranchers, selling at farmer's market, a mesquite field farm marketing webinar, and one of our most popular webinars is the Department of Agriculture Young Farmer Grant Application Webinar. This webinar and many others will be posted through this YouTube channel, so please subscribe. If you want to connect with us, you can visit our website, and I highly suggest joining our newsletter because we send out stories and notifications of events notifications of program application times and deadlines, as well as partner events through our newsletter. We do have multiple Facebook pages. One is Planning Small Farms, and that's our production agriculture Facebook page. And then we have our Texas Agribility Community Practice page that offers specific and detailed information on farming and ranching with a disability or chronic health condition as well as some really neat ideas on farm and ranch worksite modifications. We have our events calendar that I encourage you to subscribe to if you're interested in any of our events. And if you need to contact us, you can email us at txagribility at gmail.com. Before just starting the webinar today, I would like you to go ahead and pause the video, click the link to the pre-assessment in the description below, 
complete the pre-service questions and stop before we get to the post-survey questions. Please leave the tab open and then you can access those post-survey questions at the completion of the video. Go ahead and pause your videos now. All right, all right. Well, howdy, y'all. Uh, my name is Jason Morgan. I did uh, 24 years in the Marine Corps before uh, retiring a few, year, a few years ago. Uh, my wife and I, we own uh, Sweet Genevieve Farm here in Bryan, and uh, I own Leatherneck Financial Services uh, here in Bryan as well. Um, my background is uh, I graduated from A&M back in uh, fighting Texas A&M class in 98. I uh, went off to the Marine Corps and played around while the rest of the family was uh, developing the tax uh, business. And then my exit strategy was to uh, go apprentice with them and, and learn the business. And so that's how I end up here. And uh, ironically, you know, some people think taxes and farming don't go together, but actually they go together very well because very few people uh, understand the details of combining, you know, the two uh, each year. So that's how we end up here. All right, this is what I'm going to go through today, a basic outline. If we get through it, uh, we get through it. Uh, if we don't, we have more questions, we can go into them. The big thing to understand is that uh, the IRS code, uh, it's, it's not difficult to understand, but it has a lot of nuances and every individual has a lot of nuances. So a lot of things that when it comes to the detail that might apply to you in your specific situation, uh, but not to the group as a whole. So just uh, understand that. I'm gonna go through all the general stuff. We'll go through uh, the schedule F and such and uh, if there's little things, we'll have some uh, question and answer time at the end that we can try and talk through. But the big thing is you need somebody that understands it, that you can take your specifics of what you're doing as a family, as a whole. So we don't just look at the farming as an individual entity. We look at that and we look at you and what your family are doing on your entire return and how to uh, maximize the entire thing. So it's not individual parts, it's one cohesive uh, return. All right, so getting set up, all right? Business set up. Uh, how do you know what you are, okay? If, uh, if you're self-employed, means you're not incorporated and you don't have an EIN from the IRS, all right? If you're incorporated, means that you went through the Texas Secretary of State and got a certificate of formation and you have an EIN from the IRS. So that's how you're gonna know which category you're gonna flow into. All right, for our self-employed, Okay, you can have a sole proprietor, which is, you know, just one single owner. Uh, everything is going to flow to your 1040 Schedule F for your entire farm. Where it gets a little, uh, where people, a lot of people don't know is if you have a partnership with, say, your spouse. So it's, it's two owners, uh, husband and wife that are out there. Well, you can't just file one Schedule F on that 1040. You actually have to, to file two Schedule Fs on that 1040. What you'll see a lot of folks do is even though you own it as a husband and wife, whoever the uh, taxpayer is on the, on the joint return, you will usually just make that, that individual the farm owner in this case. So you just have one Schedule F. How would you file two? You would take every cost that you have and divide it by 50% and you would put a Schedule F with 50% of it on with the husband's name and then another Schedule F with the, with the wife's name. Uh, because you're actually acting as a partnership, even though you haven't filed as a partnership. All right, incorporated. All right, so if you've incorporated, uh, a lot of folks um, that I run into, they incorporate with the state of Texas, and then they file everything on their 1040, and they think that they're incorporated and they're covered. Uh, you can do that. You can do that without an EIN, but the real question is um, the corporate veil it's probably gonna be penetrated uh, if you don't act as an actual corporation. So just keep that in mind. Uh, when you incorporate, uh, you'll get the, it takes about 24 hours turnaround from the state of Texas. Uh, then you'll take those documents and you'll file for an EIN from the IRS. You can do that online. Uh, and that EIN is, is immediate, they give it to you. Now, when they assign that, they'll give you a letter uh, with the EIN on it. And it will tell you specifically at that point which tax form you are required to file. 
All right, so in that letter, it'll tell you, hey, you are a 1065 partnership or you're an 1120S S Corp or an 1120C Corp. The big thing there is if you are a corporation, your tax return filing date for the corporation only is 15 March. All right, it's a month prior to your individual tax return. And uh, it's because of the paperwork that it's gonna spit out for you. All right, some roll of thumbs here. I'll look at my notes, make sure I'm uh, hitting everything. Okay. To skip that slide, we're gonna come back to it here in a minute. All right, so how do I know which uh, tax return the IRS expects me to file? Right, you gotta look at that EIN uh, letter there. All right, now something to think about if you are self-employed, okay, is are you a hobby, a hobby farm, or an actual business? Uh, if you're a hobby, you don't get to declare anything. If you're a hobby farm, you can take losses only up to the amount of money that you brought in. So if I had, uh, you know, if I had sales of uh, three thousand dollars, I can only take losses up to three thousand dollars. We don't do hobby farms, okay? You're, we only do businesses. All right, so if you are a farm that is a business, either self-employed or a, a corporation, you don't have that limitation. And that's gonna be the difference between your, your hobby farm and a business. So that hobby farm only allows you to net zero. You can't take any losses, even though you might have losses, IRS won't allow you to, uh, to take those. That's why you want to be a business. So what does it take to be a business? Uh, it takes two things. It takes the intent to make money, right? So I intend to be a profitable business. It doesn't mean that I am, but that is my intent. And the second thing it takes is that you act as a business. So you keep financial records, whatever other records you would have in a business or on your particular farm. So if you act as a business with the intent to make money, you are considered a business. If you don't, you are considered a hobby. It doesn't have to do with a dollar figure or a size. Okay, so our corporate rule of thumbs here. Now, when you file for your EIN and it tells you what your, uh, what your assignment is there, 1040, 1065, if you file that EIN and you say, hey, I'm going to be an S corporation, on the letter, it's going to say, you need to file your 1120S by 15 March 2020 or whatever have you. It will also say in the paragraph below it that that doesn't really apply until you are approved to be an S corporation by submitting form 2553, which is a request to be an S corporation. And we're gonna talk about here in a minute in a slide or so, uh, the tax implications of having a 1065 partnership by having a, an 1120S uh, S corporation. So just keep in mind, even if on that letter it says you're an 1120S, they don't, the IRS doesn't actually recognize that until you have the approval from the 2553. Now, you can transition from whatever you are to an S corporation at any time, but when you put your date on there that you want to start being an S corporation, they're gonna look at two things. If you have just created your corporation in the last 60 days, they will let you pick any date within that 60 days that you wanna start and they'll give you the thumbs up. If however, you're outside of that window, then the IRS gets to pick what date they will assign you. And it'll probably be the date that you submitted the form 2553. So where that comes in, if you have a, a corporation and you wanna switch over uh, and you've had this, this farm corporation for you know, a year or so, uh, you're not gonna be able to backdate that. But usually what we see is people start the process, they get their, their, uh, their corporation, they get their EIN, they have the intent to do this, they forget about it because you're busy with life and running your business. And then four months later, they're like, oh, I need to, I need to submit that form. Can you submit it for me? Uh, we can, but if you try to go back four months, uh, it's probably dependent on who receives that fax with your 2553 on it, whether they're going to let you go back four months or whether they're going to give you an S corporation assignment date of the date they received the fax. 
What does that mean? It potentially means on that first year that you're going to have to file two different tax returns for your company, right? So if I had a company that I started uh, January 1st of 2019 and I didn't file for my S Corp until July 1st, right? I could potentially have to file that 1065 on that company from January to through June and file, file a 1120S from July through December. So that first year, uh, if you don't have it, your paperwork completely together, it can just make it a little confusing because now you got to split up all your expenses and all your income and all that kind of kind of snazz. We had a question. What is an S corp? Okay, a question. Uh, I think it's coming up on a slide here, but real quick, an S corp is a small corporation. So a C corporation is usually what you think of as these big corporations that you're trading publicly. Uh, it's its own entity and it pays its own tax. An S corporation is a small corporation, meaning there are 100 or less stockholders, all right? And it, as we get to the next slide or two, I, when we compare a, a partnership and an S corporation, I will show you the tax implications for being an S corporation and how it recategorizes some of your profits from earned income to investment income, which changes the tax bracket and what you're gonna pay. All right, do I pay federal tax with my 1065 or 1120S tax return? Okay, the answer is no, all right? So when you pay your normal 1040, right? If you owe money, you can write a check or you can go online and you can pay all that stuff, uh, the taxes that you owe with that 1040 when you file, all right? Um, you don't do that with a 1065 or 1120S, all right? They are flow through entities, meaning when you file that tax return, it is going to spit out, and in 1120S, it's going to spit out a K-1 for each stockholder, and in 1065, it's going to spit out a K-1 uh, for each partner, right? And in that K-1, it's going to tell you what your share of the profits or losses are for that company. And then you're going to enter that K-1 data on your personal 1040 return. So if there were taxes owed on that corporation, Right, you are going to pay those as individual stockholders. All right, so the corporation itself does not pay the tax. That's how the IRS is going to come collecting. It's through the individual stockholders. That's different than a C corporation, uh, a standard 1120, which is when we think of the, the big corporations that we trade stocks with. Those entities actually pay tax directly through those entities, right? So IBM is, is paying whatever their taxes are directly to the IRS. That's the difference between how taxes are paid. So we got these flow through entities that flow through the individual uh, stockholder or partner's personal returns, right? Hence is why you have to file the corporate or the partnership returns a month prior to your personal return because you have to have that ability to get the K-1 to your personal return, right? You can't file for an extension for uh, these corporate uh, partnerships uh, and it, again, it's going to be instead of October, it's going to be September uh, so that you have that 30 days to get the K-1 and file your own. And here's the thing. If you don't file uh, your 1065 or your 1120S tax return and it's late, so you go over that September 15th date with your extension, then when you do file it, it's an automatic $200 fine per stockholder. Right? So if you have a husband and wife listed as the only two stockholders, and you both get to pay $200, all right? So you don't want that to be late uh, getting in. All right, so understanding uh, the K-1 and what I was uh, talking about. Um, so in a 1065 partnership, every single dollar of profit that is made will flow through. You'll get a print out of the, the K-1, and it's all earned income, okay? So earned income is just like your W-2 job, that you go get or uh, your 1099 that you get, any, any money that you work the job and you get this money, all right? So now you get to pay both uh, federal income tax on it based on your tax, tax bracket and because it's earned income, you get to pay 15.3% self-employment tax. If you currently work a W-2 job, you will, you know, see your withholding. Your withholding is 7.65% because 
you get to pay 50% of the self-employment tax and the business you work with is paying the other half, right? But when you are self-employed, you get to pay all 15.3% <clears throat> of that self-employment tax, all right? So 1065, all profits are earned income, all right? The 1120S, okay? And 1120S requires at least one manager that either receives a W-2 or a 1099. So a paid manager, okay, at least one, a minimum of one. All profits after the manage, manager's salary get spit out on that K-1 as dividend income or investment income. So now you're only paying capital gains tax, all right? Capital gains tax is 14%, okay? Regardless of where your tax bracket is, what's the difference there? You're not paying the self-employment tax. Now, if you, why would you wanna pay the self-employment tax? If you wanna pay the social security, you can pay the self-employment tax and you can give yourself a 1099 and everything will be considered earned income. Uh, if, however, you want to minimize your self-employment tax, you would you could take as a manager you could take both a salary and as a stockholder you could take a dividend or investment income that's the difference in those two particular entities at 1065 every dollar of income is earned and is going to be subject to self-employment tax and 1120s you can kind of separate the profit making sure you're paying a manager some of that and paying your stockholders investment income Okay, so that's the corporation, self-employed stuff, K-1, understanding that. The big thing to take from that is to understand if you are a 1065 or 1120S, you're gonna get a K-1 and what that means as far as uh, earned versus investment income. All right, 1099s. Okay, there's two times you need to think about 1099s as a corporation. <clears throat> One, anytime you pay any individual to do work for you that's 600 or more dollars, you have to write a 1099 for that individual, to that individual. Okay, so if I, if I pay a, a guy to come out and put up a fence and his name, and I write the check, you know, to Jason Morgan, well, I now need to write a 1099 in the next January month, all right, to him. I got to file it with the IRS. Now, it's got to be over... It's got to be 600 or more dollars. So if it costs $550, you don't have to do this. All right. Uh, it's that $600 mark that it goes over. All right. So any individual, but if Jason Morgan's fencing LLC comes out to do my fencing, that is a business. That is a registered business. And it, you do not have to file a 1099 for any payment that you make to a business. All right. Sometimes we see it where people do because I think they're a little confused on who they have to do it for. If you pay an individual over 600, you got to do the 1099. If you pay a business, you do not have to do a 1099. All right. So that's it for em employees. Now, it's also not for a single event. So if I pay an individual to come out and fix my fence and that's uh, $400, later I have him come out to assist me with uh, chicken processing you know, and that's $250. It's how much total in that, in the year did I pay that individual, right? So that's 400 that's $650 that I paid that individual. So I need to write a 1099 for $650. So it's not the event in which the individual comes out. It's how much total you pay them, right? The other time uh, that you would need to write a 1099, probably on yourself, uh, based on where we're at starting up farms is, if you become an S Corp, all right, you have to have, again, that one manager, okay? That one manager has to draw a salary. The IRS understands the S Corp is to, uh, to take your profits and to be able to split them between your earned and your investment income. They understand what's going on. So they make sure that the S Corps follow uh, the rules, okay? And that rule is you got to have at least one manager who has a reasonable salary. It's there in quotes. It's exactly what it says in their pubs, reasonable salary. What does that mean? Uh, that can mean a whole lot of different things. Okay. Um, 
if I have a farm that's uh, not making a whole lot of money, I'm probably not paying that farm manager me right a salary that's going to commensurate with the guy that's uh, managing the farm down the street that's 10,000 acres. So that is a, <clears throat> a very vague term um, that you can talk to your tax professional about. What does that need to be based on uh, what your actual farm is in between startup and how much profits you're doing? But reasonable salary. Uh, so you would report that on yourself as 1099 income uh, if you're the manager. All right. And, and that one uh, is a requirement. Okay, so I think I, I hit this here. The corporations wants to have at least that one manager. We talked about it. Uh, to answer that question from before, S Corps have one to 100 stockholders. The ones that I see are set up, they're small businesses. They usually have, you know, a couple, a couple of folks, maybe one, sometimes only one stockholder. All right. Uh, sometimes two because you have a husband and wife. Sometimes it's a, a couple guys get together uh, and, and they form, you know, a a company of some sort. So you have a couple. Uh, I've not had any that are anywhere close to 100. I haven't had any that are over 10. So, but that's uh, what that is. All right. And then uh, the 1099, uh, just like your W-2 is taxed as earned income. All right. And your K-1 is taxed as investment income. Okay. So the bottom line is if you're an S-Corp, you're, you're probably going to have both of those. If you're a 1065 partnership, <clears throat> you're only going to have one, which is the K-1. Uh, on you. All right. The other thing to understand between a W-2 and a 1099, uh, you can look up the rules of when you have to give out a W-2 and such. If you'll notice, I think it was last year, California started cracking down on 1099 employees. And the reason is, is because when a 1099 is going to flow through a Schedule C, which is business income, and any expenses you have related to that job, you get to deduct dollar for dollar, all right? <clears throat> if you have a W-2, any job expenses, if you're a teacher, your military, such, they all gonna flow to your Schedule A, in which case you have to meet the Schedule A threshold before you can deduct anything, which is the standard deduction, which is I think up to 24,600 for married, and it's half of that uh, if you're single. So you've gotta get over that threshold before your deductions even matter. So if I'm at 24,600, you know, and I got, you know, uh, 10,000 in, in uh, uh, interest on my mortgage, and I got, you know, 10,000 that I give to the church or the charity, so I get 20,000 that I think I'm writing off, putting on the Schedule A and feeling good about it, uh, it doesn't do anything for you, because uh, you already got 24,000. But um, you can take potentially some of those things and write them off if you have a 1099 on your Schedule C. I have another question. Question. What are the advantages or disadvantages of an LLC versus an S Corp? Okay, so an LLC is an in, is a incorporated business in the state of Texas. When you become an LLC, all right, you then get your EIN from the IRS, which says that I am a business. The IRS will automatically assume you want to be a sole proprietor or a partnership, depending on how many owners you filed for, okay? An LLC, then if they want to be an S Corp, has to make that S Corp election, okay? So your LLC has three categories to pay taxes to the IRS as a sole proprietor, a partnership 1065, or an S Corp 1120. If you are not an LLC, you can still be self-employed. You can still have a company name. You can still go down to the county and register your farm name. The difference is that is all going to be reported on your personal tax return 1040. That's the difference. Okay, so an LLC has options on what they want to do. Self-employed, they don't have an option. You just have everything on your personal return. Did that answer the question? Okay. If that didn't answer your question, shoot it back in and we'll get back to it. Okay, your Schedule F, 
All right, the Schedule F, we're going to take a look at it here in a minute. Uh, it is uh, your farm return, and that particular form is available on all the tax, tax returns. All right, so I just want to make sure you know it's there. Okay, here it is. So here's your Schedule F. <clears throat> Hope you all can see it. Uh, big thing, okay, uh, name up there. You can only put one name. That's why if you have a husband and wife, you got to do two of these. All right, the principal <clears throat> crop or activity, if you look at the bottom – of it, this is two pages long if you look at the bottom it'll give you this little pop-up box right here and uh and you can pick it out you can also google it uh it's in there but that's where you get that code from all right if you look in block c it says uh accrual method cash or accrual there's some limitations uh to accrual we don't ever do accrual <clears throat> we always do cash uh what that means is uh when i give you it when i sell you a chicken you give me the money right there. That's cash. Accrual would be, I sell you the chicken and then I send you a bill. So my accounts receivable says I got 25 bucks coming in for that chicken, but I don't actually have cash in hand. All right. And that's accrual is util utilized to shift tax burdens between one tax year to the other. Uh, that's why there's limitations on it. We do cash only cash in hand <clears throat> is what we do. Um, uh, block E here, did you materially participate <clears throat> in the operation? Um, if you're walking out there doing anything, the answer is yes, okay? What they're looking for here is passive income. I own a farm in Montana. I don't go there. I have nothing to do with it, and I pay a manager to manage it. That is what they're looking for. That is passive income, okay? You don't get to, the losses you would take from a farm do not get, uh, you don't get as, as much based on the rules if it's passive than if you're materially participating. So everybody here wants to go out and be a farmer, rancher, you're gonna be a material uh, participant. All right, did you make any payments <clears throat> in the tax year that you would need to write a 1099 for? All right, the answer is, well, it depends. Did I pay any individual over $600? If I did, the answer is yes, okay? Am I an S Corp? If I am, the answer is yes, because I, I've got to at least write one to the manager, okay? And so it says, so did you pay anybody that amount? Uh, yes, I did, okay. Did you or will you file the 1099? Um, the answer is you have to file those 1099s. If you don't, you're gonna get uh, a fine for not doing that. And I can't recall what it is, but it's around uh, $200 again for each individual 1099 that you didn't file. So the IRS, figures it out. Uh, that's a lot. Okay. All right. So part one here, all right, is all income related, <clears throat> generated to the sales of farm stuff for the most part. Okay. You got your, uh, your livestock. Now what they're doing here on block one A and one B is they want you to uh, <clears throat> go buy a cow for a calf for uh, $500 in 2018. Right, and then you're not going to process or sell that cow until 2019. So they make it appear with line 1A and 1B that they want you to not report the expense of that $500 in the year you bought the cow, right? Because what they want to do <coughs> is they want to wait until you sell the cow, and then you would put, I sold that cow for $1,500, and you put that in block A, and I paid $500 for it. If you want to do it that way, you can, okay? If on the year that you want, that you bought the cow, you want to report, hey, I paid $500 for that cow, you can, okay? The IRS adheres to uh, GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, so you can't deduct that. But when you read it, just understand that's what they're saying. They want you to not take that expense until you sell that cow. Um, <clears throat> then we have some more uh, selling stuff here, this 1099 PATR. If you go to a co-op, and you buy stuff in the end of the year, they, uh, they send you 50 bucks, 100 bucks or whatever. They're going to send you uh, a 1099. <clears throat> My experience, they send 1099s for a dollar and everything. So, uh, and that's what's going to go in right here. All right. That's your dividends that you get from your, uh, from your co-op. Um, and they're going to count that as income instead of a, 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 like a decrease in, in cost for you. All right. So they want to make sure they tax you. All right. Agricultural program payments. Get any of that free money that's out there from uh, 
the state of Texas, Young Farmers Grants, um, NRCS, anything like that, they're gonna send you a 1099. That's where it goes right here. Farmer Veteran Coalition, they do things differently, right? So you don't see, if you get one of their fellowships, you don't actually see the money. They pay directly, or they used to anyways, pay directly the vendor, in which case uh, they used to not send out 1099s by doing that. I'm not sure, that was a few years ago, so I'm not sure if they're still doing that uh, or not. All right, and then um, if you got any money for crop insurance, uh, anything like that, any money that you get in, they're gonna, they're gonna hire you. So right here, here's one, custom hire machine work. So if I own a tractor and I own a baler and I go out and I'm, uh, you know, my neighbor pays me to, to, to bale some hay for him or, or such, there you go. That's where you're gonna put that sort of uh, stuff in. So you have a skill that you're doing uh, in addition to your farming, or if that's your sole, that's your sole deal, <clears throat> is uh, you can do that right there on your Schedule F as well. All right. Any other income? How are you going to know you get income? Because they send you a 1099. All right. If they send you a 1099. That means they told the IRS that you made money. What happens when you get a 1099 and you're like, I didn't, I didn't work for these people. I didn't do any of that. It's because your ID was stolen. All right. And this happens quite frequently uh, in farming and in construction, IDs are stolen. So you get this 1099 and you gotta do a couple things. Uh, you gotta call the business and say, hey, I didn't, do, I didn't work for you. And they're gonna say, yes, you did. And you're like, you're like, I live in Texas and you sent me this from Illinois, I didn't work for you. And they're just, they're, their gonna, answer is gonna be, yes, uh, you did, all right? So you're probably gonna strike out there. The second thing to do that the IRS is gonna want you to do is uh, call the police and, uh, and make a identity theft report. That's how you gotta fight those things. So if something shows up, so you know, that's how you got to fight it uh, for the IRS to consider it not your income, even though you didn't do it, because you, they will expect you to pay tax on that money. All right, and then it adds up your total income right here. All right, part two <clears throat> is your uh, farm expenses. Uh, most of these things are, are relatively straightforward. And when you set up your accounting for your farm and ranch, I recommend you use these specific categories and then if you need to make some more categories, you can do that. So right down here in block 32, you can make up as many categories as you want down here, all right? But what I find is keep things simple. IRS likes to keep things simple. Utilize the categories that they have the best you can, and that will lead them to ask less questions, all right? Um, the car and truck expense. <clears throat> so a couple things here. You have the option to either use actual expense or use mileage, okay? If, and I don't think this applies right now to anybody, but if you get a, a large farm and you have five or more vehicles that you utilize at the same time, you are not allowed to take mileage, okay? You can own five vehicles, but I only use two or three of them at one time. You can take mileage, but once you hit that, five vehicles because I have enough ranch guys that they got to get in those vehicles and go do stuff. So I have to use those at the same time. Then you can only take actual cost on that mileage rate right now for uh, 2019 is up to 58 cents a mile for business miles. If you take mileage, you cannot write anything else off on that vehicle. It's all included. All right. Depreciation is included gas, oil, insurance, everything is included in that mileage 58 cents, right? So it simplifies things a little bit for you. Additionally, if you take mileage, you have to keep a written logbook. I know there's apps and stuff out there. Um, I have heard stories where apps, you go into it to put some stuff in and all of a sudden it's blank and it's just zeroed everything out. So uh, I don't use an app, I just use a spreadsheet. Um, but you got to have certain things on it. You got to have the date, you got to have the to and the from, the destination, the origination, uh, and you gotta have the actual odometer reading start to finish, all right? So not, I want 21.9 miles. That's great for adding up all your miles at the end of the year, but that doesn't cut the mustard for the IRS. They want actual, uh, actual odometer readings per vehicle, per vehicle, all right? So that's how you do the mileage. Uh, you can do the app, just make sure, you know, you have something there that you can print out and put with all your paperwork at the end of the year, put on your computer. 
so you have that. That's what they're going to ask for when they when they come look and uh, if they if they audit you. If you decide you want to do actual expense, right? Then you can actually depreciate the entire cost of your truck. Uh, your gas, your actual gas cost, actual fuel cost, <clears throat> repairs, tires, any of that stuff. If you have a farm truck in the state of Texas, um, the requirements uh, from the state of Texas for that plate are you're only going to use it for your farm. Uh, you can go, you can take your kids to like school events and uh, church. That's pretty much it. There might be something else in there, but, but that's pretty much it. What do they not want you to do? They don't want you to go to another job with that farm plate that's on there. So that's just something to, uh, to keep in mind. Now, the IRS doesn't care about you taking your kids to school, right? So you take all those expenses and you can do it one of two ways. You can either do uh, the direct method, right? Which is the actual fuel cost and oil cost and all that that I used this truck for just my farm stuff. So if you just use it for farm, you just add all that stuff up, you use it exactly. If you're like, well, I do, you know, do these other things, go to uh, take my kids to school and go to church and such in it, that's fine. The RS says you can, you can take, just put all those costs together and you can take up to 75% uh, of those costs, of those actual costs and write them off. All right. So when would I want to do mileage versus actual cost? Well, Two, two things you got to think about. One, you only get to make that decision once. Once you make that decision on that vehicle, you are not allowed to change it at all, forever, on that vehicle. So the only way to change it is to sell that vehicle and get a new vehicle in, and then you can change it, all right? So once you make that original decision, either do mileage or actual cost, that's it, all right? The second question you want to look at is how many miles do I drive and how much is that vehicle worth? If I just went down to the store and bought a brand new, you know, F-350 for 55 grand, now I got something that I can depreciate over five to seven years and that's going to give me, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year to write off. All right. And I'm not driving very far. <clears throat> if I have a lower cost vehicle and I have a lot of driving, you know, then you might look at the mileage because the mileage never runs out, all right? So if you depreciate that vehicle, uh, you're gonna depreciate it over five to seven years. And then after that, you're just gonna have some gas costs, okay? With that mileage, that 58 cents, it doesn't go down. Usually if it does, just about a half a cent or so, but that's gonna, you can use that 58 cent. You keep that truck for 20 years, you can 58 cents a mile for 20 years, all right? So that's kind of some of the decisions you think about when you wanna pick actual cost versus, uh, versus mileage. All right, you can kind of pick up on uh, the other things, chemicals, conservation, custom hire. That's when I'm hiring, uh, you know, the guy to come, I'm hiring him to come do a specific job, like come uh, hay, uh, bail my, my hay that's out there. All right, uh, depreciation. So if I was gonna use actual costs for that truck, I would put all my expenses in block 10 and I would depreciate that truck here in block 14. All right. Uh, Section 179, um, section 179 is where it's, uh, I have a slide in here, but it's where on a new item, you can take 100% of the cost if it's less than a million dollars and you can depreciate it in one year, in year number one. Uh, all right, employee benefits. Um, uh, that's any, was there a question? Yes, me. I had a question. Um, about that year, is it like, let's say that I opened a business on October 1st of 2019. Uh, when you say I have a year for, to get that credit, is it just from October to December or from October to October? That's the only thing I'm confused okay. about. Okay, so you're talking about for the vehicle? No, I'm talking about um, the credits that I can take up to, is it 10,000 or, uh, you, you just- Oh, you oh the section 179? Yeah. You. It's, you can only take that in the year, the calendar year that you bought the item. So if you bought the item in October of 2019, then you can only take the hundred, the section 179 depreciation in 2019. That is not all depreciation. That is just taking a hundred percent of that one item in 2019 vice normal depreciation, which depending on what it is, farm machinery is about seven years. 
right? And you would take the cost of whatever you bought and you would basically divide it by seven. And each year in the next seven years is how normal depreciation works. So if I bought a, if I bought a truck for $7,000 and I depreciated it normally, it would, I, would, I would get a $1,000 uh, write off each year for seven years, okay? If I section 179 depreciated it in the, in the calendar year that I bought it, so if I bought it in 2019 on my 2019 return, then I can take all $7,000 in 2019. Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> we had another question that asked if block A could change from year to year. Block A can change from year to year. Uh, yeah, because your farm can potentially change. So that's not, that block A thing is not anything that's going to hold, hold anybody up. Uh, if that answers the question, you, you can change that. A, you know, we change, did the, did the name change, uh, or did your corporation change? So when you set up your, your corporation, you're going to pick farm and ranching. You can do different things within the, any of these right here or anything else that doesn't show up. Um, all right, moving through, uh, quickly. So I know we're running out of time here, gas, fuel and oil. I'm going to hit gas, fuel and oil on farm gas so if i buy gas and i use it on my farm in my tractor <clears throat> i don't have to pay federal highway tax on that gas okay but i already paid it at the pump so what you can do is you fill out form 4136 all right it's federal gas tax reimbursement for on farm gas only <clears throat> this is in gallons so you have to know how many gallons you used in your tractor or in your truck or in your mule or whatever you're using on the farm and if you fill out that form it'll give you back that uh the actual federal highway gas tax on that okay labor hire this is when i hire the guy to come build my fence right so that's the difference between your labor hire and your custom hire question question um does any of this apply to nonprofits? does any apply to nonprofits? uh Keeping good records applies to nonprofits, all right? It's a tax return 990 for nonprofits, and it does. They're going to want to see where your expenses are, but in the end, nonprofits don't pay tax. So as long as you have a good accounting system with a good uh, profit loss and balance sheet, that's what the nonprofit needs to, needs to, to focus on. Because if you've been approved as a nonprofit by the IRS, <clears throat> which takes can take up to a year, if you're thinking about doing that and it also takes you have to have you're no longer an owner you got to have a board and you have to have a met at least three non-related board members and if you're married and you had your wife in there then you have to have an additional three you always have to be outvoted is the bottom line and that application process is a little longer i hope that answers that question all right um so just moving through, you can kind of pick up on all this stuff. You're like, hey, what are other expenses I, I need to think about? Well, uh, how are you selling your whatever you're selling, all right? If, uh, if you're just buying uh, calves and fattening them up and, from the sale barn and taking them back to the sale barn, then, you know, you probably don't have a website. You probably don't need a cell phone, uh, any of that stuff. But if I'm selling my produce or I, ne I need a website, well, not only do you know, do I have things like my cost of my website down here, but how am I going to access my website? Well, I got to have the internet. Now I'm going to have the internet down here, right? How am I going to communicate with my, uh, the people I'm selling it to? They're probably going to call me on the phone, right? So now I've got, you know, my cell phone down here, right? Do I need a fax? Do I need uh, things like that? Do I need, um, I'm just getting into this and I'm new. Uh, and so I need to go buy some boots and, and some clothes that I can go out and do ranching or, or whatever I need. Yeah, that's going to go down here. All right, professional <clears throat> clothing, that kind of stuff. So you got to get in the mindset. You got to switch from being uh, an individual to being a business. And everything that you think of that you need for your business, you need to think, well, that's why I have this stuff. This is why I'm, I'm making the purchase for the business first, not because these boots look cool, right? Do I need a pair of boots uh, to go do my farm and ranch? So that would be prote protective uh, equipment. So you get you got to have the the mindset of I'm I'm running a a business now, so that you can actually 
identify all the costs of running that business, right? I don't have uh, the internet just so I can email mom. I have the internet because I have a website now and I got to email customers and do PayPal or Google Pay or whatever. So that's the mindset you need to get into uh, right there. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Here it is. Depreciation versus a, a deduction. The bottom line, if you buy something that's over $2,500, you're <clears throat> a single item. You need to think about, well, that's got to be depreciated, all right? So do I want to uh, depreciate it? Most farm equipment, seven years there. If I don't want to, okay, section 179, all right? As long as it is less than a million dollars, section 179 might be a player, okay? So there are some limitations on that section 179, um, but the big one is, a million dollars, okay? A million dollars, and it's got to be new uh, on there, and I can and I can uh, I can take that stuff. Otherwise, <clears throat> I'm going to depreciate it. Anything over twenty five hundred. Now, I have a lot of deductions, um, and I don't need to take all these deductions in one year because I'm setting on my farm, and so I'm losing money the first couple of years. What you can do is you can package things together, right? So uh, I got a rain uh, catch system out on my place. I can take everything, right? So I can take all the pipe, I can take the barrel, I can take the gutters, I can take the labor, I can all package that into one. It's a rain catchment system. And now I can depreciate that uh, over a couple of years. So that's where you got to balance. How much do I want to depreciate? How much do I want to expense on this year? All right, not the, the benefits of expensing everything is usually what we try to do. But that's not always the case. All right. So Depreciation, when you add things up and you're depreciating multiple things over multiple years, and that might take you a few years to build up having multiple things that appreciate over multiple years, but then it is a running group of money that automatically uh, helps lower your taxes each year. So depreciation is not to be overlooked, all right? If you have any questions about depreciation, there's section 179, there's bonus depreciation, uh, there's a normal depreciation. There's your pub right there, IRS pub 946. So you can look it up. It'll tell you, hey, what did I buy and what would I depreciate it for? Okay. I mean, you got uh, computer, software, all that kind of stuff. You can depreciate anything. Quick question. Question. Uh, Dana asks, does the business cost have to be purchased after the business startup or can it be the same year? Okay. So, so business costs, does it have to be after the business startup or the same year? Yeah. You know, once you, uh, this is how we look at it. When did you start thinking about the business? When did you start thinking about being a farmer and all those expenses? Okay. That's probably when your business started. All right. If you didn't take those expenses, cause it's still an idea and you're still putting it together. Keep all those receipts. When you actually, go into, I bought, I bought my land to start my farming business. You have now started your business and you can start expensing or depreciating those items. Now, <clears throat> there is a thing called startup depreciation. All right. Startup depreciation is where you buy stuff with the intent to start a business at a later date. Okay. The limitations there, you can uh, you can expense $5,000 of that, up to $5,000 of startup and year one, if your total startup costs are less than $50,000. We don't usually uh, we don't usually look or look to utilize startup depreciation. We look at if you're actually starting a business, then you have started your business. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean I sold. I, I didn't sell. When I bought my cows to start my ranch, I didn't sell my meat for another year. But my business started. So my business started, my ranch started in 2015. You know, I couldn't sell anything until 2016. I have a question. Yes. So, like, if I've been traveling and, and learning about something, like let's say January and February, and I didn't actually create my business uh, until October 1st, do I get to yes. you know, do yes. the expenses? That's, all, for the that's, all in, 
It's all in the same year. Okay. Okay. As long as it's if, all in the same year. Okay. It's, it's all in the same year. Okay. So if you would have done all your training uh, in the previous fall, right, and not actually start your business until the spring of the next year, right, in that case, you would probably just choose to wait on taking all those training and all that expense and just wait. You would put it on the next year's tax return. So if I, uh, I did all my training in the fall of 19 and I didn't start my business until the spring of 20, all that can be written off on my 2020 tax return. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I did my training in the spring of 19 and I started my business in the fall of 19, all that goes on my 19 tax return. Okay. I mean, I didn't really like, so like I said, the training happened in January, February. I created the business in October, but I haven't really started because it's still, you know, I haven't, I haven't even opened a bank account. So then all the expenses that I've done in 2019, whatever little or small, I should wait to uh, submit them for 2020, correct? Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I talked about this. Why well, I'd appreciate less than $2,500. Uh, and, and honestly, right here, your tax paper will probably know the answer because he's the one playing with the numbers. So if you're doing your taxes yourself, and you're putting things, you know, in TurboTax or whatever, play around with the numbers, see what it gets you, all right? All right, uh, depreciate. Can you depreciate land? The answer is no, okay? Land does not wear out, all right? However, anything you do to that land, you can depreciate or expense, okay? So if you buy a, uh, a farm and you put in non-native pasture, right? If it's non-native pasture, it's an improved pasture. I can expense uh, all that cost or I can depreciate it. But the land itself does not. Fencing, buildings, <clears throat> pasture, I don't know what else you can put out there on a land. <clears throat> Trees, I mean, you can read through the examples here. Um, but the bottom line is anything you do to the land is an expense uh, or depreciation, all right? But the land itself, is not. All right, so here's some links that I put up. I think I have everything up there except for uh, one pub. Okay, so pub uh, 225. Uh, you might want to look into that one. That's uh, for farmers. All right, specifically, chapter 13 talks about family employees. Yes, you can pay your under 18 kids uh, money to do their farm chores and make them go buy their own clothes with it. All right. It's, uh, so take a look at uh, Pub 225, Chapter 13, so you can utilize that. Uh, do, do know that if you're, you can pay kids, right? Um, if you pay them over 600, you got to give them a 1099, all right? But once they turn 18, the month they turn 18, you, uh, you have to look at whether you have to start running payroll uh, taxes on them for their uh, Social Security and, uh, and Medicare. So. Just keep that in mind. 18, you got to know what you're, what you're doing at that point. Okay. Um, <clears throat> other things that come up, uh, if you read the, the Farmer's Pub, uh, if you walk into some, you know, H&R Block sometimes or something like that, they'll tell you, well, <clears throat> you can't write your farm off because you got to have a profit in five out of seven years. Actually, the publication, the IRS publication itself uses the word should. Okay. So your farm should be profitable five out of seven years. Um, it does not use the word shall. So, you do not have to uh, necessarily meet that. Make sure you talk to your uh, tax repair about that. Deer leases. Deer leases are where the whole hobby thing comes in. All right. So if uh, if you own a deer lease, that is not a farm. All right. And the IRS will not look at it as a farm. Uh, and if you want to run that as a business, you know, renting your cabin out and all that kind of stuff, you can run it as a business. But just because you own a deer lease, don't think that that qualifies as a farm. Um, Pub 225, Farmer's Tax Guide. All right, and I think that's uh, all the notes I've got right there. So if there's any more questions, we'll, uh, we'll burn through them. Um, can you quickly um, go over some of these post-survey questions just to make sure we've covered everything? All right, post-survey. Can you make an S-Corp election when filing for an EIN? Anybody know? It's on one of my slides. 
Uh, I'll tell you at the, at the beginning, right? Uh, you said yes. it's out of to 90 days to make that assignment. Okay, so it's 60 days. And, oh, 60 days. Yep, <laughs> and you cannot make it when filing an EAN. It'll ask you, do you want to be an S-Corp? Are you an S-Corp? You can hit yes, but when you get your paper, it'll actually say you have to file form 2553. All right, it's, and this right here is uh, just a, a typo from probably from me, but it uh, should be form 2553 um, that you have to file no matter what. All right, so that is the only way the IRS will recognize you as an S Corp is through that form 2553. What's the maximum section 179 deduction limit? Anybody? One million. Yep, one million, that's correct. What is the threshold for a single item purchase that you must appreciate and cannot deduct as an expense? 2,500. Yep, 2,500. Which IRS publication talks about depreciation? I'll tell you this, it doesn't have a one in it. Um, Nine, when, six. <laughs> when are you required to file a 1099 MISC or NEC? One thing, it was on a slide, right, at 600 more dollars. You will file through 2019. So right now we're using 1099 MISCs, all right? You a lot of, you probably get them if you get rental income or anything like that, you'll get one of those. Starting next year in 2020, they're removing the compensation block from the 1099 MISC and they're making their new form, which is a 1099 NEC, which is a non-employee, non-employee compensation, right? So <clears throat> bottom line, it's still a 1099. They just want you to put it on another form. I don't know why, probably not good. They've been redoing a lot of their forms lately though, the last couple of years. Is land eligible for depreciation? No, but improvements are. That's right. That is correct. All right. So any other uh, any other questions? Hey, Jason, I typed a question in. and didn't want to chime in uh, until we got to them. Uh, using your own land for your farm, uh, if you're not using all of your land and you're donating a section to it, um, is, is there a way to claim that? Or is that just you're being generous to yourself? Or I'm, I'm not sure if you got a document. Okay. You so you're... Uh, so you got 10 acres and you're only using eight acres and you're, and you're donating two acres to somebody? Uh, no. Let's say you live on 10 acres and you're giving two to the farm, just to simplify it. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, for, for, income, for income tax, uh, if you're only using two for your farm, they, 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 don't, they don't care how many acres you got. Okay, for for property tax, that might be uh, something that you don't want to talk about. But yeah, for income tax purposes, they're not they're not concerned. Uh, and if even if you if you donated that to somebody else, there's no way you can't get any you can't get anything from donating a truck or donating land to anything. Okay. So if you, if you're donating it to a, a nonprofit, they have to write you, you probably want to enter into uh, you know, some sort of agreement where you're, you're going to compensate them for the rent of the land. Basically they have to be able to write you uh, that you, you know, they got to be able to give you a form that says you donated so much money the bottom line so that would be between you and that nonprofit if you did that but what you can do uh, is rental income is investment income so if you own uh, we recommend that the individuals own all the assets in the in the farm rent them so if you owned a tractor right and you've incorporated your farm you could you could rent that tractor to your corporation you know for whatever hundred dollars a month now at the end of the year on your 1099 if you're making money i mean if you're not making money it doesn't matter but if you're profitable on that 1099 you'll have 1200 dollars of rental income as part of your profit and that is automatically investment income so you don't have to pay that self-employment tax i don't know if i answered your question or not on the on the donating thing but you you have to some degree i guess my thought is a business doesn't start from nothing and somewhere you've got to cut a piece of it off for the business to 
to have under its umbrella of yeah, those resources. You can, uh, just not you sure. Can, well, I mean, you can sell. That. You can sell it. You can rent it. You can. Uh, you can do a loan to it. Um, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, is you're bringing. It's your business. So even when you incorporate, it's your business. If you're looking to uh, to cut it, cut it off, you can deed it to the business. You can you can sell it to the business. Again, you can rent it. Uh, there's nothing you get from donating it for the business to use without, uh, you know, for free or anything like that. No, there's no, the only charity, and this brings up something else because when I was working here, I saw a lot of guys applications and they wanted to get started in farming <clears throat> so they could give stuff away, you know, and act as a nonprofit. Uh, the only way you can give anything away, whether it's money or or B for food is you've got to give it to a, an official nonprofit who will write you a form that says you, you know, gave so much, right? But it's gotta be a nonprofit recognized by the, by the IRS. So if you give your, your food or anything directly to individuals, it's great, but just understand that's not something that you can write off on your, on your, you can't write it off as uh, donations, one. And two, it doesn't matter if you're self-employed, a partnership, or an S-corporation, donations all flow back to your own Schedule A, all right? So make sure, uh, like, I don't donate to my son's soccer club, right, uh, to get a, to get a, to advertise. I pay for advertising so that I can, that is not a business expense paid for advertising. If it's a donation and I get, you know, an advertisement out of the deal, then it has to go on my schedule A and that doesn't do anything for me. It's also not why I'm doing it. I don't know. Are we talking, are, are we getting anywhere, David? I think we are. I, I know I've got a million questions and want to keep this brief as well. So I, I, I might find a way to contact yourself or another another pro at this later. I've got another question if you take clients and how they get in touch. Yeah, that's a, uh, I do take clients. Um, I'm located here in Bryan. I do have clients as far as uh, Longview, I think is my longest uh, client. Um, so you can get in touch with me. Uh, that phone number right there, you can call me. Uh, it's probably easiest to get in touch with me uh, by that email uh, right there. I've um, got a website and got the Facebook deal. Um, so when I have clients that are, that are, not local. Uh, depends on you know where you're at, how far away you are. Uh, I mean, I got some that are on the, not even in Bryan on the outskirts. So we can get together and we can and meet up. If we can't meet up, what I do for like the Longview folks is uh, we'll talk over the phone about it. Uh, I'll email you you know the, the things that I need filled out, and then you usually they just FedEx them back. Uh, if you want to email them back, you can, but you know there's a lot of personal information. They'll FedEx it, and then. Uh, and that's usually how I work it. Just work it on the phone. We'll do uh, talk everything on the phone. Send me your stuff. I'll look through it. We'll talk again uh, and go from there. So that's usually how I do it for folks that aren't in the, in the vicinity. All right. Any more questions? I know we ran over. Aaron will probably fire me. <laughs> hey, no, you're working for free. Uh, you're, you're donating your time, right? Um. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, all right, well, that's uh, that's all I got. You know, uh, you can play back the video when they post it and look at those forms or anything we talked about. You can uh, shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. All right, You're thanks, awesome, guys. Jason. Well, we're really grateful for that. Um, if you guys who are uh, still on the webinar with us, if now you can click back over to that tab uh, where you were doing your pre-survey questions and now go ahead and you can do your post survey questions there underneath where it says post survey and um, just go ahead and answer those and uh, then like Jason said we'll go ahead and post the uh, the recording and uh, on our YouTube channel you can find that on our Texas AgriAbility. Uh, Mackenzie if you want to show them real fast the tab over and show them the Texas AgriAbility or it's right there yep um there's it on YouTube. You can also find it from our website. And we will be posting um, quite a few other webinars upcoming. So I would definitely suggest uh, subscribing 
to our events calendar. You want to show them their, the events calendar real fast, Mackenzie? And um, like I said, you can subscribe to that. Definitely sign up for our newsletter and we'll announce those coming through as well as a bunch of the workshops that we have coming up around the state. So um, if you guys are don't have any other questions, we'll let you go. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll hang out for a little bit uh, in case you do have a question that pops up and hopefully we will get to visit with you all soon. Thanks everybody. your accounting uh question was do you use quickbooks yeah so question i do i use quickbooks I, I do use quickbooks um i'm not sure that i like it a whole lot necessarily uh you got some excel spreadsheets that seemed a lot easier for me to use uh, i know greg he had some as well um but i'm i'm trying to give quickbooks a try again uh for the business expense stuff. It's just a, it's a, uh, what is it? it? Takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot more time to use QuickBooks than it does Excel in my opinion. Um, and I don't use it for its full features. I have some clients that do, they use it for billing and invoices and writing checks. And uh, if you're using it for all that kind of stuff, then it, you know, it's probably worth it to you. Uh, I just use it to, uh, to keep different accounts uh, organized. So I kind of think, you know, we're going to, I'm going to give it another try here this year, but, uh, for the farm and stuff, I kind of feel like my Excel spreadsheets were just a little easier for me to jump into and, and register my income and uh, expenses. So that's my two cents. Awesome. You might want to, uh, check out wave, uh, W A V E and it's a, it's a free accounting software. I think the, the, Thing my uh, tax guy was able to do, I was able to add him as like a, a person who could see it, like an authorized user. And then I can just up, upload my monthly statements from my farm account. And because he set up my chart of accounts, it just automatically categorizes most of them. So. Yeah, I, and I, I, QuickBooks can do all that as well. And, and uh, you can do QuickBooks online, you can do QuickBooks accountant, or you can email things back and forth. But uh, downloading it uh, from your bank and such probably ha it helps whoever's keeping your books do it quickly so that is a good feature so uh, does that help you with people clients can they share their QuickBooks stuff with you through their tax person and is that easier yeah usually um, it can get kind of complicated if you share it if you use the uh, account and you kind of send it to me it cuts you off so pick uh, January 31st it would cut you off on the 31st. So you couldn't make any changes prior to that. It was sent it to me to uh, update your books up to that. And then I would send it back to you. So that is that is one way. When I do it, I would prefer not to, to do that at all. Um, and, and we don't from, uh, you know, even my brother and sister and, and their companies, they don't use it like that. They just, if you want us to keep your books, uh, we'll keep them. We'll, uh, we'll need an accountant's access to your credit card and your uh, your bank statement, which is uh, basically read only and, uh, and your banks have that so that we can download the file that Aaron's talking about. Uh, we'll upload it into the program. We'll do your books and then we'll send you out, you know, your, your monthly uh, QuickBooks statement so you can see where everything's at and such. But that just seems to be a lot easier. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done waves, but that, that's how we do it when we do uh, QuickBooks accounting for customers. Awesome. Yeah, I know Wave, if you log, you can log into your bank account from Wave and then it'll automatically, you don't have to download them anymore. It just automatically populates them on there. My, but it, I think it's only the major banks, like we use a little credit union and that that's not on there. So we have to download and upload, but some of the bigger banks, you just log into your account and it'll, it'll just automatically update that. So um, it's helpful because we don't usually slow down enough to do very great accounting uh, as far as getting those receipts over to, to our guy, our tax guy. So <laughs> he likes it. <laughs> anyway.
All right, you guys. Well, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, in interest of Jason's time, we're going to let him get out of here. And, uh, thanks again. You guys have his contact uh, information. If um, you can see, you want to click on that again real fast. Um, if you still have it pulled up and so you can contact Jason there and uh, hopefully he can uh, give you some more great advice and get you guys going point in the right track it's, I can tell you from experience it's always easiest to start out on the right foot than it is to try and go back and do all of the uh, that accounting and and updating and all of those kinds of things so uh, I do suggest uh, getting some kind of record keeping system and a good tax professional from the beginning that will make everything a lot easier, I think, as you move forward. So with that, we'll tell you all uh, good afternoon and goodbye and holler at us if you need us. Thanks so much for joining us.